So good morning, everyone. Um, today is a part of our a little bit part of our basics course. Um, so um, for those of you just joining or those of you that are uh, logging on just to uh, share with you sort of how we constructed the year is the first two or three months. We go through a lot of the basics of just spine surgery in general, some things in the operating room, some things for clinic based and diagnosis based. Um, and uh, so today we're just more back on the uh, on the basics of uh, placing pedicle screws um, and we're going to talk the basics of doing it freehand versus using um, some assistance with x-ray for the minimally invasive setting. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, the uh, pedicle anatomy is important um, and certainly nowadays we have a dramatic benefit over uh, over those that we're trying to do this um, I, at the very beginning in that we have things like CT scans and MRIs that are really very much able to help us to understand a basic anatomy of our vertebral bodies. In the uh, thoracic spine, um, there are certain landmarks that are absolutely critical to help you with uh, knowing where the screw is going um, because as you will see is, you know, we only see the surface topography of um, of of our uh, of our spine we don't get to see uh, deep um, certainly navigation and those types of technologies which i'll be addressing today as well um, uh, kind of change things a little bit but i think for um, just being able to place um, screws well i think uh, just understanding what you can do from a freehand standpoint is really really important so a couple things that you have, you have to be aware of the uh, superior articular process is probably the most critical piece in understanding um, the starting point from a medial lateral orientation. Um, and we'll go through that um, here in a second. But if you look at the axial view, um, you, you want to have a pretty clear understanding of where the spinal canal is. So where the in the thoracic spine, where the spinal cord is, uh, because you never want to place a screw that's going to compromise uh, your spinal cord. Um, the um, sagittal orientation um, uh, uh, for placing your screw in your starting point really uh, involves the contralateral transverse process. So understanding um, that uh, you're trying to put in two screws symmetrically um, so that they're always uh, pointed at one another. Um, you realize that um, to figure out where you're going to place that, that screw, you want to use the contralateral transverse process as a target. In the lumbar spine, um, there's a couple um, uh, landmarks that are also really critical. The first is the pars and the pars interarticularis and the transverse process. And the intersection of those two is almost always going to be your uh, uh, starting point. And then again, for your uh, uh, sagittal orientation, you want to use the contralateral transverse process. Again, that's how you're how you're going to understand where you're going to um, aim your screw. Um, a couple um, other anatomic considerations uh, just to uh, realize this. Um, each vertebral body is going to differ a little bit um, in its uh, transverse angle. Um, it's also going to vary in its depth and pedicle size, the diameter of it. Um, and then you also have to have a bit of an understanding of that sagittal angle. In other words, um, what orientation we are going to be aiming as it relates to the superior and inferior part of the vertebral body. Um, uh, yeah, so in general, um, if you were to map out the lumbar spine and, and a lot of these figures are going to, you know, stand true for probably 75 percent of three quarters of your patients. Um, again, why it's critical to study all your CT scans, um, especially those in those patients that have deformed spines or have had tumors or any type of resections or you know, decompressions, um, et cetera, is like the pedicles can actually change in, in morphology. So you always want to be able to evaluate that. But you can see that um, going from L1 where the it's really quite a, a vertical um, oval that's narrow down to L5 where the orientation of the pedicle changes. Um, it's good to have an understanding of, of, what, the, of what they look like. Um, other things um, that if you've been in the operating room, I'll, I'll ask you about frequently is kind of the uniqueness about different pedicles. Uh, for instance, at T12, T12 is actually the only pedicle that has a medial to lateral traje trajectory. So if you were to um, look at um, all 
of these uh, cadaveric spines that were mapped. Um, they mapped all their um, transverse angles. You can see that the only one that actually had a lateral to assume a medial to lateral orientation was actually T12. That doesn't mean you have to put a screw in in that trajectory. It just means that if you take the true transverse angle of it, um, that um, that it will actually be in, in that trajectory. And then you can see um, as you go from L5 down to the apex there at T12, every screw is going to go just a little bit less um, from lateral to medial until you get just about straight up and down at L1 and T11. And then you work your way slowly back up to that very lateral to medial angle up at T1. And you could probably very easily put um, the cervical spine on here as well where those angles continue to go from a more lateral uh, to medial trajectory. So when we talk about um, doing um, freehand screws. Um, these are the things we we're mentioning earlier, which is like your exposure is absolutely critical. Um, if you don't have good exposure, then you have the potential to deceiving yourself. Um, and when you're putting in freehand screws, having all those anatomic landmarks, they all kind of are uh, little clues as to where the pedicle is. And um, uh, all these landmarks have to give you individualized, an individualized sense of what's happening under the surface topography. So again, uh, exposure is key. Um, you want to make sure that um, you've uh, exposed the facet joints, the transverse process, and the lamina at every single level. And then we typically will remove the inferior articulating process. And um, we do that in general in the open world for two reasons. Number one is to expose the joint so you can remove the cartilage off of the superior articulating process. And then from a screw standpoint, um, it's critical to understand your um, your pedicle anatomy. Um, in the operating room, this means cleaning the spine really well. Um, so you don't want to have a whole bunch of soft tissue on there. You want to see nice, clean, white. Recording. as you work your way up the spine um, that you are um, essentially making these cuts um, that are going to remove the bottom of the um, excuse me just removing the inferior tick so here's these uh, basic cuts um, and then once you um, uh, release the inferior tickling process you'll get a view like this now you can still see here, um, we're not quite ready to put screws in because you've got the cartilage still in place. You have a little bit of soft tissue that's bridging between the super articulating process and the transverse process. and All that needs to be cleaned up um, so that you get a really good sense of what lateral is, what medial is, uh, and what your transverse plane is going to be like. And you see us here just scraping things off and continuing to clean. Um, and all this really is in preparation. So um, one of the rules that um, I like to use, um, and I think it was uh, Lanky that published this article a while back, but if you have the superior articulating process exposed, um, your starting point should never, ever, ever be medial to the mid part, midpoint of that superior articulating process. There's about 100% medial breach rate if you are medial to it. So it's nice because it always orients you into the right place. Um, if you start um, on the lateral third to half of the of the facet joint, um, you will uh, very highly likely be safe when it comes to uh, not uh, when it comes to your um, axial plane. Um, from T10 to T12, um, in general, what we're looking for are these little ridges, and you can see the yellow dot there is sitting right on the ridge of the intersection between the lamina, um, the superior articulating process, and the transverse process, and that. That little ridge in general is going to guide you into the right place. Um, and um, at, from T10 to T12, you're typically right on it, if not just a hair below it. Um, and then as you go up the spine, um, you'll actually climb up into the facet joint, towards the facet joint, and you get onto the top of that line. So you go a little bit higher. And then once you hit the upper thoracic spine, you're going to work your way right back down on top of the uh, on top of that on top of that ridge. And then at uh, T1 and T2, you go back into the valley. And honestly, typically at T1 and T2, I kind of use lumbar spine rules where it's usually just right about in the middle of the transverse process. Um, so that's another um, little tip on, on the upper thoracic ones. 
in the lumbar spine, uh, the starting points are uh, really, I feel like a little bit easier. Um, the PARS is really critical to dissect out um, and uh, the intersection between the PARS and then the midpoint of the of the TP very commonly is the is the um, starting point for your um, pedicle screw. So lumbar spine just a, just a hair easier. Uh, the only the note on this is like in adults when you're doing this, um, the anatomy can get obliterated by degeneration. And um, when you're doing, you know, work on a really severely degenerated. Greg, you got muted. Yeah, Greg, we lost your audio. Bruffy, why don't you just do the voiceover? That was really a nice invitation, John. Don, thank you. I was about ready to do it. Um, too sexy for my pants. No, never mind. Greg, we still can't hear you. I'm in his I'm office. office. We're Debugging. Yeah. That was weird. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow my mic got turned off. So cool. All right. Uh, so you guys lost me at the. The last thing we heard was you were telling us how degenerative finds the anatomy isn't as reliable. Cool. Yeah. So Greg, you had us at hello. Oh, thanks. <laughs> So sweet. I just needed to sip my coffee. It's, it's, it was my it must have been my timer. Um, so yeah, in the Greg, the last thing we heard was you say bees buzz. Yeah, bees buzz. <laughs> like this, like this. <laughs> um, so all right. So in the in the degenerative spine, you know, the pars and the TPs they can get really overgrown. The facet joints get really, really overgrown, and it's hard to sometimes find your way. And I always think it's really critical taking that IAP off because it will help orient you, get right onto the pars, find that lateral pars. Um, and sometimes you have to actually with curettes or other things like actually get rid of the overgrowth of the bone there. Um, just so you can see things, um, see things um, well enough to be able to safely uh, get your starting point and, and, and uh, put screws in. If you add on top yeah. of that, got a lot of rotation um, uh, it can get really squirrely uh, pretty quick and so you just have to uh, be able to assimilate all that information and I think it's important to be able to assimilate it on what you're seeing in the operating room with what you know from your scans that you studied preoperatively with regards to CT scans and MRIs just to be able to take take what you know to be real and what you see um, and then uh, um, again assimilate that information certainly having um, navigation really changes this, but um, you're, we're really going to talk about more navigation assisted today rather than uh, using um, using navigation like a video game um, today, which is, is totally fine to do. Um, but uh, I think if you're exposing the whole spine, um, then having having this is, is is really important. I think one thing navigation will probably end up doing though is that you may not need to expose quite the extent. Um, that we have traditionally done in the spine, you may be able to limit some of the exposure because uh, you now have um, a means of uh, finding your starting points a bit better. But um, never, uh, never replace what you see with your eyes and what you feel with your hands um, for what's uh, happening on the screen. Um, so um, I, will, I would, I would add that little tidbit as well. <clears throat> 
So the transverse process method, again, uses the PARS interarticularis. Um, I, I love the PARS. It like leads you straight um, to the TP. And when I do my dissections, I like to find the PARS, and then I follow the PARS out laterally. It leads you right to the transverse process. And then if you can feel the top and the bottom of the TP, um, then you're basically going to be pretty good um, with getting your start point. So if you have your um, dis the, the distance of your TP um, and your PARS, then you can basically uh, get your starting point just about every time. And then you're going to aim towards the contralateral side at the exact starting point that you would assume on that side. And so um, in, in that way, you're very consistently going to have screws that look uh, pretty decent uh, when you're checking them with x-ray uh, later on. Your PARS marks your, um, uh, is a marker for your medial lateral, so you never want to be medial to your PARS. Um, you usually want to be a bit more lateral, and like we showed in the diagram, a lot of these screws in the lumbar spine are really going from a more lateral to medial trajectory, um, so you're going to be safest uh, starting lateral to that. And then with regards to saddle trajectories, you always want to aim towards the contralateral starting point. So if you do that, people always ask, how do you get your orientation of your screws right in, the, in, the, in that transverse plane? Well, you're always aiming at the contralateral starting point. And if you do that, you're almost you're, you're going to pretty consistently be in a, in a good in a good place. Um, you know, a lot of times you can leave even the driver up, up on one side so that you actually see the, you know, a kind of a virtual um, line of where the screw is going and then you can you can map. Um, you can map your uh, your other screw based on the, the the driver that's still sticking up in the air. Um, <clears throat> as far as medial lateral trajectory, again, um, you always be aware of the uh, medial border, the SAP, um, and um, uh, you are triangulating towards it. So if your starting point goes in lateral, um, if you're aiming towards that uh, um, uh, medial border, of the SAP. Uh, you almost always try to triangulate it through the pedicle. So in other words, if you, if this is the trajectory of the straight up and down line um, at the medial border of the SAP, um, uh, if you get at your starting point it almost and you're aiming towards that line, you're almost always going to uh, avoid that uh, critical 25 millimeter depth. Um, uh, and that's just using a basic triangle to, to get there. If you have a congenitally small canal, you probably have a little bit more liberties. If you have a really large canal, just be aware of that um, because you may need to flatten your hand a little bit more in, the, in this in this axial plane. Um, uh, Lanky um, developed his own little probe for this uh, purpose in the thoracic spine, um, where he likes to go lateral with the uh, curved angle um, of the Lanky probe for the first 20, 25 millimeters. Um, and then uh, take the probe out, feel it, and then switch it to go into a more medial trajectory um, to go in the rest of the way. Um, this is a, a very nice technique. Um, he's published on it um, and uh, makes uh, makes good sense. Some of us uh, like to laugh and say, I've never seen a curved screw, so why would you use a curved probe? Um, uh, I think that's just it's been a bit silly and uh, I like to be silly at times, but uh, I do typically use a straight probe and then if I need to, I bail out with the medial, immediately orange, sorry, with the curved one. Um, I think it is very important to understand the haptics of it. So you do want to have soft hands and a lot, of, a lot of these screws will take some force, but it's like uh, having to develop that skill of being able to apply pressure and at the same time feel the tip of this, uh, feel the tip of the, of the gear shift. Um, that does take doing a lot of these screws and I think it's important that um, it's that's a skill that you develop um, because that translates actually into the MIS world and it also translates into the navigation world where um, you uh, have the haptics um, that are important for you to understand when things aren't right and um, even if the screen is telling you you're in a good place um, and you don't feel that it's right I would almost always uh, bet on the feeling over the navigation. Um, and so when you have a, a disconnect between those two, it should prompt you to uh, be very critical of what you're experiencing. So again, uh, uh, using this technique, you can see how you can make nice adjustments and stay in, within the pedicle. And this is just showing, you know, you may have the starting, the starting point perfect, um, uh, but there may need to be some changes that happen on the very tip of it. You can see as you follow these lines out, um, uh, you're able to change your uh, your angle in the transverse plane, and your hand has to make this adjustment with the curved gear shift. 
because um, um, as you change from a lateral trajectory to a medial trajectory, um, the the handle of the gear shift will also change in that transverse plane. So um, allow it to go into that plane. Um, and uh, um, so that's, that's an important piece of that. And here's that uh, pretty famous paper that was uh, written on that. Um, you want to feel all four walls. You're basically feeling a tube, right? And so I think that's really important. Like, uh, um, like when things go in really smooth, you know, a lot of times it's pretty easy just to stick the probe in. But if you have any question at all, like any of these, any of these um, pedicles where there's, where it just doesn't feel entirely right, you have to remember that you're feeling a tube. And so we talk about four walls, but that would, you know, that would say that there's a square, but there's not really a square. It's really a tube. So you really need to be cognizant of being able to feel not only the, the, the walls of this tube that's been created, but you also need to feel um, the depth. And so it's important that you're able to um, distinguish um, uh, when things aren't right, both in the depth from a depth standpoint, as well as from a, a wall standpoint. And then, you know, the things you really want to be on the lookout for is medial and inferior. Like that's where you kind of don't ever want to miss. Um, you can have absent um, uh, pedicles. Uh, they can be really thin like these. Oh, Lose it again. Um, and uh, in this, in these instances, there's an in and out in technique that works pretty nice. Um, you get your usual starting point. You ride the lateral border of the pedicle and then you get into the vertebral body. You can use K wires for this. You can use X-ray or fluoro for it. Um, a lot of times you're actually going um, across the uh, rib um, here as well. So you can actually get a when you go into bolts or probe, you can actually feel bone all around you. And then you want to have a pretty decent harmony when you check these uh, screws when you're done. Um, they should be pointing at one another. Um, and uh, if they're pointing at, another, at one another in both planes, you're almost always going to be in a really good in a really good spot. We do use um, trigger EMG to make sure um, that things are OK, especially when we're not navigating. Um, and uh, there you just you're for trigger EMG you're looking for cadence in my opinion you're not necessarily looking for absolute value and, but that I mean is if you have a bunch of 30s and all of a sudden one of them is a 12 um, even though it didn't fall below the 10 threshold uh, you may want to check that one because you were very very normal and then all of a sudden you're 18 milliamps off in the same way if you start triggered EMG and they start at eight but every one of them is seven eight nine eight seven eight eight like there's probably either uh, a breach at every single level, which you should make sure that you don't have, or it means that um, they're just stimulating low um, in all in all the screws. So look for for cadence there, um, and then again look for the harmony. If you don't have the harmony, you s just make sure that things are all right, um, uh, and uh, uh, that would be one of the critical things. Um, so for OR setup, especially for fluoro based. Um, uh, um, guidance that uh, we typically just use one fluor uh, fluoroscopic machine um, and uh, kind of their usual setup um, so that you can see the screen a lot of times it's annoying um, if you can project the screen um, on both sides of the table that's really helpful because you're typically working with um, another uh, another partner or a fellow or resident and you want to be able to do that so the interesting thing is like the anatomy is really the same, but now you're just translating what you see with your eyes on an exposed spine and you're translating translating that over into the um, into the uh, 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 radiographic anatomy. So it's really important that you have a good view of the um, vertebral body that you're working on. So if you look here at L5, you want to make sure that you, you adjust the um, that you adjust this fluoro uh, so that it looks like the image on the right, not the one on the left. On the left, you don't see a clear end plate of uh, L5. On the right, you do. And that's what you want to see. You want to make sure that at every level that you're going in, that you have a very clear understanding. If you don't have that, you will be off on your uh, superior and inferior trajectory. Um, and then obviously, you have to have your rotation uh, as well as you can have. But the lateral board of the pedicle is one that we typically use. Remember, you can have really overgrown facets that can push you more and more lateral. Sometimes that gets difficult in getting a good starting point um, where it pushes you all the way out on the TP where you don't want to be. Um, uh, so sometimes you have to actually you have to fight for your position here. Um, uh, but again, the, the same principles apply. You want to be at the junction of the facet um, and uh, the transverse process. 
And a lot of times in the MIS setting, you can see that your hands will oftentimes be in a lot more of a lateral to medial trajectory, um, and that's okay. Um, also remember that 20 to 25 millimeter depth as kind of a target where the pedicle body junction happens. And um, as long as your triggered EMG or your screw um, uh, or jam sheet is not breaching the medial border of the pedicle at that 25 millimeter mark, um, you should be pretty darn good and safe getting into the vertebral body. So again, same thing here. You can see that um, uh, on an AP view, we're still in the middle of the pedicle. Uh, the GM sheet is at the pedicle body junction. Uh, this is going to be a really safe screw uh, to get in. So, um, and then you'll uh, do this uh, really over and over and over again. Um, S1, um, uh, again, same same thing using uh, the anatomy that you uh, know from the open uh, techniques. Um, uh, same, very same concept um, where you're uh, targeting the pedicle. A lot of times we start a little bit lower and aim a little bit higher. Um, I do like to aim towards the sacral promontory if possible. Um, and again, the same principle applies for the medial lateral um, uh, trajectory so that your uh, jam sheety hopefully is hitting the pedicle body junction uh, before you're hitting the medial border of the pedicle. And then you send this uh, bad boy in all the way to um, the sacral uh, tip of the sacral promontory. Um, here's a gentleman that we fixed um, a while ago. He's like three or four years out now. Um, did an A-lift up front, but then came the, the perk screws. Um, and um, just to kind of show you um, what this looks like uh, using jam sheety needles, placing your wires and working our way up. Here's L4 going in, L3 going in, the same thing, mid, mid, mid TP in right in the middle of the pedicle, um, and then um, uh, uh, working our way um, up. I actually use predominantly AP fluoro, um, so I'll chuck them at the end. Um, uh, but even here, if you look at the uh, jam sheeted trajectory on the left image, you'll see that you're starting to flatten out a bit as you're getting up into the uh, upper lumbar spine relative um, to what we we're doing at the bottom. And then check the lateral and place the screws in the lateral, um, working your way all the way down to um, the sacrum. Um, just making sure you have your lengths correct, uh, checking the AP to make sure that you're happy with uh, the cadence um, once again. Um, and then um, that's <clears throat> working uh, frenetically um, with uh, using the interoperative rod bends that we did uh, by gaining our points and placing our set screws and getting it all lined up afterwards. So. Um, and that's what it looks like once you have it all hooked up and there you go so i think i am out of time here so um if we have any questions i'd be happy to entertain those i have a quick question um just about surgeon preference i think i've seen a few different ways um of variation with regards to like choosing like the cortical screw versus like Kinsella screw, like the threads more um, closer together in the cortex versus um, bicortical. Sometimes people go in the S1 uh, versus like MIS planning, um, just like having them in short just because you don't want to risk being long versus always measuring to the anterior cortex. Um, I guess how do how do people end up deciding which of those preferences they go with? Well, in the open world, right, to do a bicortical S1 screw is pretty simple because you can measure the front and then you know, and you see me do this where like if it measures like 47, um, you know, you have to make you have to make up your mind whether you're gonna go 45 or you know 50, basically. Um, I would say as of late, I have been going more the 45 route. Um, unless they have a really steep sacrum or the hookup looks like it's gonna be difficult, well then you can put a 50 and just not sink it all the way. Um, and uh, so you have to, some of those things are just based on what, again, the cadence of the construct looks like and the demands of that of, of that individual patient. I, while I love bicortical screws, I know that if I'm putting in iliac fixation, um, uh, I, you know, I think if you have a nice long screw that's going towards the promontory, um, you know, having that bicortical uh, screw, I think, can be 
can be important in really crappy bone, but if you had decent bone, I think if, you know, if you're at the edge of that cortex or just grabbing a thread or two of it, I think it's okay. The reason I've got become a little skittish, David, is I've done a couple of revisions now um, where we had to go back in from the front. Um, and uh, it reminds me a little bit of like the C1 screws where on an x-ray, it looks like you're not quite bicortical, but when you go into the operating room, because those, a lot of those screws are quite lateral, um, they're actually not at the midpoint of the sacral promontory, which would be okay. Um, but if you're more lateral, there oftentimes you have, you know, two, three, four, even five or six threads hanging out in the middle of the abdomen. And, you know, um, that makes me a little bit skittish. So if your screws are really, really medial at S1 um, and they look like they're going towards the sacral promontory, then a long screw is probably fine. But if your screws are going lateral, just realize that your vasculature is going lateral to the vertebral body at that level too. So I've, I've been going at probably at erring on a bit on the shorter side rather than the longer, just out of a, a avoidance of uh, any long-term, any long-term issues there. Um, did I answer your question? Hard to plan MIS. Um, yeah. MIS, David, use the inlet view and you can, you can tap out front and then you, you, a lot of the systems have a gauge for the tap. So you get a sense of how long it is and you, you do the tap under inlet view. So you can see it breach the cortex and then decide just like Greg. As said with open, do I go a little longer, a little shorter? I leave the 50 millimeter screw a little bit proud just so that I can breach the front cortex and not the screw as deeply dorsally. You just have to make that decision on the fly. But the inlet view is really helpful for MIS because you can't see it, you can't feel it like you can with open. And remember, like, you know, you need to plan a lot of these surgeries ahead of time with your CTs and you're going to measure your screw trajectories and all that. But a lot of times the gantry, Especially here, like what we have available to us here, we're not able to manipulate those images perfectly, right? Um, so, you know, the the screw lengths are a guide. They're not an absolute. You know, what's absolute is when you're doing the surgery and you're feeling, and and whether that's MIS or open, like you know, don't be hell bound and putting in a 55 if you're feeling a 50. Um, it, that should all what you feel should always trump. Um, uh, with what's happening out there uh, on the screen or wherever else. Blaz, any insight onto that? Go ahead, Mike. I was going to ask what your thoughts are as far as starting point uh, preparation. Like, are you ever using a runger to remove some of the facet and kind of get like a more cancellous point to enter in or? I guess, like for me, it seems a little easier instead of fighting the anatomy, but also you get more bleeding. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is that just an experience thing? Uh, yeah, for the most part, I don't love the ranger until we're done with the placing the screw in general. I mean, I mean the lumbar spine, um, you'll oftentimes see me uh, chopping off the um, SAP, um, and, but not to get the starting point, but rather to really see that PARS uh, TP intersection better. Um, in the thoracic spine, I really like you to use a burr for your starting point because that makes it really, really accurate. Once you kind of munch everything off, yeah, you're right. It bleeds more and you kind of lose uh, the accuracy of your anatomy a bit. So I like personally, my preference is leave the anatomy where it's at, find the ridge, get your starting point perfectly. And then once you have your screw being placed, then you can chomp off the, the bone. Okay, yeah, you, no, you definitely do lose some of the anatomy for sure. Um, awesome, thank you. We're good. 705. Thanks, everybody. Have an awesome beginning of your week. Thank you, Greg. All right. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Nice work. Thank you.